In my previous episode, I presented to you the story of the cultural entrepreneur Ugucione Ranieri di Sorvello. Today, I would like to explore with you the story that precedes him in the figure of his mother, Romaine Robert, and the story that followed both of them in the foundations established in their name in Italy and in the United States. We'll do this in dialogue with his son, Ruggero Ranieri, historian and president of the Sorbello Foundation, with a family friend and former Italian ambassador to Abu Dhabi, Havana and Santiago, Giovanni Ferrero, and the scholars Antonella Valoroso and Claudia Pazzini, respectively professor of Italian studies and consultant at the Sorbello Foundation, and art historian and curator of the collections of Palazzo Sorbello House Museum in Perugia. Now, the mother of Uguccione Ranieri di Sorbello, Romain, Robert was an incredibly inspiring figure who left an indelible contribution in the fields of education and female entrepreneurship. Born in 1872, she grew up on the East Coast between New York and Philadelphia in a family which included among its members French Huguenots as ancestors, the writer George Bernard Shaw as her second cousin, and the businessman Christopher Robert as her paternal grandfather founded a company of imported goods and funded the first U.S. school abroad. In her 20s, after losing her two older sisters to scarlet fever, Romaine moved to Germany with her parents, who were in search of new start after their loss. From Dresden, where she was based, she visited Italy on several occasions, and in one of them, she encountered the Marquis Ruggero Ranieri di Sorbello, heir of Umbrian aristocracy and owner of a 17th century palace in Perugia, of the medieval Sorbello castle on the border between Umbria and Tuscany, and a country estate in Pischiello, near Lake Trasimeno. A year after their first meeting in Rome in 1901, she married the Marquis and moved to Perugia. One can get an idea of the strong bond existing between Ruggero Ranieri and Romain Robert by considering an episode occurred during the Resistance War. As Ubuchon himself recalls in some handwritten notes, after the announce of the armistice on September 8, 1943, his father, Ruggero, was arrested and imprisoned in Perugia. At that time, he was already 80, and he was certainly not doing well. However, his sense of humor was vivid as always. He decided, therefore, to attach a handwritten sign outside of his cell on which one could read the Marquis of Sorbello, condemned. He was released a few days later, and Romain decided at that point that it would have been safer for them to move to the Sorbello castle. Unfortunately, from January to May 1944, the Sorbello castle was occupied by the German army. Despite the German occupation, Romain managed to hide in some rooms of the building several British officers, making sure their presence was not revealed in the valley. Ruggero was arrested again by supporters of the Republic of Salò upon an order of the head of the province, Armando Rocchi, who tried in vain to make him confess where his three sons were hiding. Since this time, Rocchi did not seem willing to release him. Romaine herself, being a very assertive woman, as Ugucione remarks in his memoirs, decided to take action. She went back to Perugia and forced Rocchi to receive her. The fascist prefect asked her where the kids were hiding, but Romaine replied she had nothing to say. When Rocky roughly scolded her for the bad education she had given to her children, Romaine replied in Italian with her strong Anglo-Saxon accent that he was indeed the one who should have been ashamed for keeping an 80-year-old man in prison. A couple of days later, Ruggero was released. Their relationship was a complex encounter of two completely different identities and backgrounds. But certainly, their son, Uguccione, found inspiration from his parents' laborious negotiation of words in their ongoing dialogue, sometimes confrontational but never interrupted, mingling aristocratic heritage and modern entrepreneurship, or in the context of education, strict obedience and experimental approach. 
They were married for about 40 years and had ups and downs like most couples do. However, there is no doubt that between Romain and Ruggero it was love at first sight. Or, better said, love at first love. In fact, the two met one evening at the theatre in Rome. Romain had gone with her father to see Ermete Novelli, the comedian. As he was very funny, she laughed a great deal. Ruggero, who was seated behind her, noticed that she laughed at the same things he did and was greatly impressed by this detail. After the performance, he uh, observed Romain speaking to a lady whom he knew and asked to be introduced. A year later, they were husband and wife. The time at the palace and her new life situation as she gave birth to her firstborn Gian Antonio in 1903 coincided for Romain with two major discoveries of the Umbrian tradition seen from a distance in her position as a cultural outsider and of entrepreneurship as both a reappropriated need to connect to her family heritage and a space of freedom outside the rigid codes of the palace. While working to restore her new residence in Perugia, Romain found embroideries and fabrics of old in the palace and despite her husband's neglect, she discovered their value, studying the local stitch technique, the so-called punto umbro, and sketching decorative motifs which her friend Carolina Amari turned into graphic designs. As she traveled the countryside surrounding the family estate of Pischiello, she also came to contact with the shocking backwardness of local peasants and decided to elevate their condition in some way. Moved by the desire to bring local crafts back to life in a modern key and emancipate the young peasant women in the Umbrian countryside, Romain Robert established in 1903 a decorative art business in Perugia and in parallel with it an embroidery school at the Pischiello residence. If we consider the work of my grandmother Romain in Umbria in Perugia starting from the beginning of the century, we certainly need to focus on her activities in the context of the Industria Feminile Italiana. What were the Industria Feminile Italiane? The Industria Feminile Italiane were a movement which encouraged the revival of uh, handicraft skills, mostly in embroidery, but also textiles, lace making, and other activities in a variety of Italian locations. These activities were sponsored by a group of uh, enlightened upper class women, with also the encouragement uh, and the patronage of the royal family. The artistic bent of this movement was inspired by the neo medieval, uh, neo Renaissance. Uh, motives, which were also part of the arts and crafts movement, which was spreading all over Europe and in the United States. In addition to this, there was a strong commitment to the issue of female emancipation because these handicraft activities were designed to offer employment to peasant uh, women, an avenue towards professional training and uh, personal emancipation. So we have this uh, movement which basically was spreading all over Italy. Its headquarters was obviously in Rome, which was composed basically of an artistic element, the revival of decorative arts, and also philanthropic element, and an element uh, of women's emancipation. This therefore was the context. If we look at what the Industria Feminini were doing at the beginning of the century in Rome, exhibition, uh, fairs. We find my grandmother or man was part of it. Obviously the beginnings of this on her part were uh, here in Perugia and in Andria. When she married my grandfather uh, Gero in 1902 she moved over here and she began uh, researching old textile, old patterns of uh, embroidery. She began creating her first um, sketches and she was helped by a, a very skilled and able designer, Carolina Amari, who was also a part of the Uste Femini Italiana. Very shortly after she came, she began to set up a small laboratory employing the peasant women of the family estate. And gradually this activity broadened and became larger. So at one point there were 100 female workers employed in what was then called Scuola di Ricami, Embroidery School, Ranieri di Sorbelli. 
in her American upbringing, Romaine found interest in the arts and crafts movement and the settlement programs on the East Coast, encouraging immigrant women from Italy to recover artisan skills and gain independence through their work. These experiences found synthesis in her new life in Umbria, as she turned local decorative arts into a platform of female emancipation. Alongside this enterprise, she set up a cooperative. In other words, she encouraged other textile and embroidery schools around the region to come together, join forces, create a cooperative and open a shop so that production could be shown and could be also exported. In other words, turning what was basically a very local activity into a much more commercially oriented business. Thanks to the help of Carolina Amari and textile designer Florence Colgate, she contributed to the opening in New York of the Scuola d'Industrie Italiane in 1905, a school aimed at emancipating Italian migrant women through the manufacture and sale of embroidery products. Pieces from the Sorbello Embroidery School or by Carolina Amari are still held in the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Romaine's work as philanthropist and entrepreneur put her in touch with other American women and expats in Italy. One of them, Alice Hall Garden, the American wife of the economist and politician Leopoldo Franchetti, similarly founded in Umbria a textile business, Tela Umbra, and a school for the farmer's children in her residence, Villa Montesca. It is through her that Romaine Robert came to know the experimental educational method of Maria Montessori. Both Romain and Alice opened schools for the children of the farmers and the people from the estate based on the Montessori method. This was between 1907-1909. So this was also a pioneering experiment which we owe to my grandmother's enlightened visions. The Greek pedagogist had just opened her first children's house in Rome. And it was right at the time that the two American friends started to collaborate to improve the rural elementary schools they both have founded and also to offer an adequate training to their teachers. Alicia Garden Franchetti opened her elementary school in her summer residence at the Villa Montesca in 1901, while Romain's elementary school was opened at the Villa del Pischiello two years later. In 1907, Maria Montessori had been invited by Alice Garden to visit her school at Villa Montesca, and she also had the opportunity to meet Ron Robert and visited the elementary school at Pischiello. A couple of years later, in fall 1909, the Montessori method was introduced both in the elementary school of the Pischiello and in the Montesca school. Romaine's educational enterprise and business grew over the following years. Her embroidery studio was featured at the 1906 International Exposition of Milan and her Pischiello school was presented at the Exposition of Turin in 1911. In 1909, the Pischiello Elementary School received an official request to present objects and photographical documentation for the 1910 Bruxelles Universal Exhibition. The Ministry of Education selected the best Italian school of that time and evidently the schools of Villa Montesca and Villa del Pischiello were considered among the Italian excellences of that time. The Pischiello Elementary School was presented through a photo album, this photo album, which included photos of the classroom with or without pupils, photos of the teacher's house, pictures of children working in the gardens or pictures of children divided into classes. The pupils' homeworks and notebooks, best hexams, were also collected together with the school registers. The photographs of the Montessori material and the pupils who used it, and finally the reports on the application of the method in first grade. Despite all this careful preparation, the Ministry of Education in 1910 decided not to participate to the Universal Exhibition anymore. Unfortunately, all this precious documentation on the elementary school, the Pischiello, went 
lost forever. In the meantime, Romaine gave birth to her second son, Ugucione, in 1906, lost a daughter at birth in 1909, and had a third son, Ludovico, in 1911. It is around this time, in 1908, that Gertrude Weatherhead made her appearance in the Ranieri house. Miss Weatherhead was the British governess who took charge of the children while Romaine was traveling, exposing them to Anglo-Saxon culture and experimenting with them a radically new method of education. She would be with the family until 1924 and would be a fundamental figure in Ugucione's life, nurturing his affective and creative intelligence and offering him an alternative learning space beyond the regimented style of his aristocratic life. Unlike the governess of the previous generation who were uh, full of nobles or bourgeois in poverty, forced to work out of necessity, the women of the new century were quite different. Free and proud of their English culture, they lived this, their job as an opportunity, especially when they were called to carried out abroad, as it was often the case. Although Romaine travelled uh, along all Europe to develop her business with her brother's school, especially during the First World War, she never failed to make her children feel her presence. Exchanging daily letters with her governess, Gertrude Weatherhead, who daily informed her about what was going on at all. From her travels, the Marchioness Romaine often brought back many gifts for her children, most notably clothing, toiletries and picture books. What emerges observing the recently discovered correspondence between Gertrude and the Marchioness of Cervello and exchanges lasted between 1908 and 1924 is that the Montessori method was adopted not only at the Bischiello and the Montesca school, but it was also applied in the private sphere of the Ranieri di Sorbello family. All three Romain's children were privileged experimenters of the materials invented by Maria Montessori and learned to write and read as guinea pigs of her newly created method, as Ugucione would later say. Romain's passion for education and entrepreneurship left a profound found mark on her children and on the local territory. While her business was forced to close in 1934 due to American protectionism and the financial crisis of 1929, the elementary school continued throughout the fascist era and forged in central Italy a unique legacy of virtuous trade and education. The Ranieri di Sorbello School of Embroidery lasted about 30 years. It came to a close during the 1930s. In parallel, also the cooperative Arti Decorative Italiane was eventually closed. Why did my grandmother decide to close what had been a successful enterprise? There are a couple of reasons for this. One was the difficult trading environment of the 1930s with tariffs. Most of the goods were subjected to tariffs and so the promotion of these artifacts abroad, and particularly in the United States, had become much more difficult. And also both my grandmother Romaine and Carolina and her sister Francesca Mari, who were her great uh, supporters and inspirers, they also were becoming rather old. So I think they decided that uh, the school would close and it closed first in 1934 and then also gradually in the following years. What happened after that? First of all, Romaine was very jealous of the products of the school so she didn't want uh, copied. So her message was the school was closed and the products of that school were no longer produced from the market. In parallel, she also was well aware of how many beautiful things the school had created. I found a letter to her son Father, in which she was explaining that what was left, and there were a lot, uh, hundreds of pieces left produced by the School of Embroidery, was to be displayed in a museum. And the museum was to be entitled to Carolina and Francesca Mari, whose health, whose talent she valued immensely. This was a, an important message that she left because she realized that not only the embroideries of the school, but also the other beautiful objects of the collections of the palazzo and therefore belonging to the, the ancestors of the Romanianis and Bello family, should all take the form of a museum display. And this was very far-sighted. She wrote this letter in 
1946, just after the war. At that time, it was very rare for the aristocratic palazzo to, to be earmarked as a museum. Finally, we have to, we have reached this point, but it has taken us 50 years. Uh, and this is another sign of how far ahead my grandmother was able to see. The legacy of our men is far from dead in the sense that, yes, uh, the school was closed. Nobody can produce on uh, artifacts uh, named after the school. But the skills, the traditions which the school created are not uh, finished. There are lots of um, former workers or descendants of workers of the school who have, have tried to keep up some of the activities. They produced uh, textiles, embroideries, disseminated some of the techniques, and still today, especially in the regions of you know, the Lake Trasmane or the Lake Trasme, where the school was actually based, we find a number of women who are still working in that tradition. There's still a legacy there, of women inspired by, by the work of women. And we're still famous what Romain was able to set up. The greatest legacy of Romain is the sign she left in her children, in particular in her son Uguccione, who took from her the passion for American culture and a profound entrepreneurial spirit. Uguccione was already in the States when my father was posted in Washington in 1932. I don't know when they met, but they were on the same wavelengths and they were both working in the same direction. I think my father greatly admired and appreciated the freedom Uguccione was enjoying as an intellectual, being an Italian professor, a writer, a journalist, a communicator. The freedom he had to implement his ideas and his initiatives while my father was more to follow instructions that were coming from the ministry. Their friendship, I think, was also strengthened by the fact that they were both together when uh, my father met what would become my mother when she arrived in the state as a foreign student in uh, 36. Shortly after Uguccione had to go back to Italy, my father also was back in Rome in 1938, and in Italy he landed in his same uh, apartment he lived uh, for a few months <clears throat> before being posted to Rome. During the war, they uh, were not in touch, but they were on the same uh, land, breaking their allegiance with the foreign regime and working for a new Italy after the war. Uguccione back in the uh, United States and uh, my father abroad, but always keeping in touch and trying to get together when they were both in Italy. I met Uguccione in Perugia. He asked my parents to join him for a weekend, and my parents took me along. Together we all went to the theater to see Van Dausiris, that was the most famous soubrette in those days, and she was performing at the theater in Perugia. I was very thankful to Gocione to have me taken and given me such an occasion that my parents by themselves wouldn't have given to me. The day after, he took us all to the Trasimeno Lake, and there he gave us a detailed explanation of how Hannibal and the Carthaginians set a trap for the Romans, and how the Carthaginians and their tribes caught the Romans in and pushed them back into the Trasimeno Lake and drowned them all. It became pretty natural that I would ask Uguccione to become my wedding witness. I had gotten to know Uguccione better when I entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1962. There Uguccione had a very nice room where he was working, adapted to his needs. There were big piles of newspapers spread all over, press clippings, ashtrays, and among other things, old-fashioned but perfectly working coffee burner with a spiraling cord that became red when the burner was turned on. There I shared with uh, Uguccione long chats. At the end of one of these, I asked him in 1968 if he 
could be my wedding witness. I was wary that he would feel an ease with uh, the other wedding witnesses, but uh, I was relieved when I knew that on my bride's side they had chosen among the two uh, Indra Montanelli, that was a very good friend of Ugo Cione. Montanelli was a big fan of Fiorentina and Ugo Cione didn't give much for football, but they were friends and I'm sure they uh, had a good time together. I cannot really make you a portrait of Uguccione, but I can tell you how I recall him. Finely dressed, without ever taking care of what he was wearing. Inquisitive look. Eager to safeguard his independence. Very forceful in his thinking, with a big drive. He was very kind. He was not looking for consent, but for time. For time to fathom his interests and to get you involved. That's how I recall him. The story of Romain Robert and Uguccione Ranieri di Sorbello continues today in the legacy of the foundation established in their name in 1995. About 20 years after the death of Uguccione in 1969, his wife Marilena De Vecchi and his son Ruggero began to reconfigure the space of the family palace in Perugia and eventually transformed it into a house museum and an educational space. Today we have two foundations. We have an Italian foundation, the Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello, and an American foundation the Romain and Uguccione Sorbello Foundation, briefly the Sorbello Foundation. So there are two non-profit organizations today. How did we get to this point? Let me start uh, from the beginning. My father Uguccione died in 1969. He left us uh, an enormous uh, legacy of unfinished projects. His legacy was difficult to continue to carry, but he also inspired us because uh, of his work, manifold interest. There was another enabling factor, as I say. My grandmother, Romaine, had left a trust in the U.S. which uh, she wanted her grandchildren to benefit from. And so this was also an encouragement to me and to my mother, Marilena Di Vecchi and Maniere Di Sorbello, to start working on some of these ideas. So reorganizing spaces in the Palazzo, in Perugia, and to create a philanthropic, non-profit organization that could carry on some of the ideas. Both of my grandmother, Romain, and my father, Lucioli, he want also the legacy of our ancestors in previous centuries. And so at first we set up a small non-profit organization in New York. This was the lightest form of non-profit organization which was then available. We had a board of three, my mother, myself, and a, a cousin, Louise Ambler. She has been an art curator at the Fog Museum in Boston, and she was very committed to this work we were trying to carry on. The first task of the previous American Foundation was to reorganize the library and open it to scholars and to display some of our beautiful objects, pictures, engravings, and other collections. After about 15 years of this work, the activities had broadened enough for me to consider the creation of two foundations rather than one. One based in Italy, the Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello, and one based in the United States, the Sorbello Foundation. Both of these were created around 2011-2012, so about 10 years ago. The first, Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello, carries out research on the collections here, contributes to the cultural life of Perugia, and also manages the house museum, which has now been open to visitors, and uh, the Etruscan Web, which is also open to visitors. The US Foundation, the Sorbello Foundation, is designed to encourage links between our activities here in Perugia and the broader public across the ocean. The transatlantic story of the family from Romain's travels to Uguccione's cultural diplomacy finds expression today in the Foundation's commitment and mission to foster ties between Italian and American cultures through lectures, research grants, and interdisciplinary projects. As for its founders, the Sorbello Foundation still operates as a bridge-building institution connecting Italy and the United States, but also in the footsteps of Romain and Uguccione's example, arts, education and industry. The Sorbello Foundation is meant to carry on the legacy both of Romain and Uguccione, who devoted most of their lives to bridging the two sides of the Atlantic in terms of culture, in terms of personal and human contacts, in terms of writing by the father of 
who spent most of his life trying to present to the American public the life and culture of it. For those who visit Perugia today, the foundation collects the unique artifacts of Umbrian embroidery, organizes public events and manages two museum sites which are now important tourist landmarks in the city, Palazzo Sorbello House Museum and the Etruscan Well. At the same time, the foundation is the gathering place of students and scholars and continues to be a creative laboratory of a transatlantic culture. Just like Ugucione's office in the 1950s, an office located at 690 Park Avenue in the building that still houses the headquarters of the Consulate General of Italy in New York, the Italian Fondazione Ranieri di Sorbello and its American counterpart, the Sorbello Foundation, are hotbeds of initiatives and activities. Around the walls of this room you can see some of the many folders belonging to the Sorbello archive, a treasure trove of knowledge and primary sources that would make happy any scholar or student. Because the history of the Sorbello family started in the Middle Ages, continued in the following centuries, and it's still very much alive today. However, being aware that coming to Perugia is not exactly the easiest thing to do for an international scholar, both foundations are carrying out projects aimed at creating a digital archive. The entire collection of the Balletin, the Italian scene, is already accessible through the JSTOR Open Community Collections. Our plans for the future are certainly very ambitious. In 2021, in the middle of the pandemic, the Sorbello Foundation launched the Romain Robert and Uguccione Sorbello Fellowship. The first Sorbello Fellows have already been appointed and we all look forward to seeing the output of their research. Meanwhile, the call for application for the 2022 fellowship has just been posted online. The legacy of Romain and Uguccione keeps inspiring us every single day. If you're planning a visit to Central Italy, I hope you will make the Sorbello Palace your next stop. I invite you to get involved with the foundation and its activities and academic and cultural life, both virtually and on site. You can find more information about it at www.sorbellofoundation.org or on Instagram at sorbello underscore foundation. As a final remark, I would like to add here my thanks to the foundation for allowing me to know its incredible story sponsoring the episodes dedicated to Guccione and Romain and for starting this fruitful exchange with Italian innovators. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, I invite you to subscribe to this channel or to the newsletter on the webpage of the show at www.italianinnovators.com to receive notifications of new episodes and know more about this project. You can also follow me on my LinkedIn profile or on Instagram at Italian Innovators for updates, news and additional materials. Thanks for your support. Arrivederci e alla prossima.